Thanks. So uh, my name's Alex Henderson. Um, I'm here from Pushpay, and I'm about to talk about no payment left behind, which is sort of just a bit of a short journey through uh, improving our payment resiliency over time as we've grown very fast as a company. Um, so I work for a company called Pushpay. I'm a principal engineer there. And um, we're a technology company that is working in the church sector. Um, we're really sort of building easy to use software that helps churches grow their ministry. So that's through payments and engagement solutions. Uh, we have around 350 staff, um, and we serve over 7,000 churches. And we're based out of Auckland, New Zealand originally, but we actually have more staff now in the US based out of, sort of Seattle. So in the beginning when I joined Pushpay, that was 2014, I was engineer hire number five, our VP of engineering, and I think in fact another engineer in the audience, Carl, joined about two months before then. Um, and things were pretty simple. We'd sort of inherited a very basic monolith. Uh, so we were hosted on a single machine, uh, we had sort of a mobile API and a website on there, and there was like a small database sitting to the side. Uh, we were dealing with multiple gateways. Some of them we talked to via Spreadly, but for the most part we were talking directly to the, uh, to the gateways, and we only did card payments. In fact, we were really simplistic. We would allow a user to have a single payment method at a time. There wasn't a wallet where they could have a different payment method. They would have to delete that one to add another one. Um, and we were processing about $1 million a year, so payment volume was very infrequent. Um, we really were sort of kind of in the hobby stage at that point. Where we are today, we're now processing $3 billion a year, so a lot more volume. We use Spreadly for all our gateway communications with credit cards. Um, we also support a number of other different payment methods, so we support ACH, credit card, New Zealand bank payments. Uh, we do sort of process checks, check scanning, that kind of thing. And we scale to about 30 to 40 nodes, and we're hosted in AWS now, whereas originally we're sort of in a colo. Um, we're also a little bit different. So, uh, unlike many people where they're sort of uh, able to sort of process funds and aggregate them and then distribute them as necessary for a payments company, we have thousands of merchant facilities. So every single one of our customers ends up with their own merchant facility. Um, this presents quite a lot of interesting challenges from an engineering perspective, but does mean that we're quite well suited to what Spreadly does um, by having sort of gateway configurations um, become to be registered as we go. Um, initially, when we started growing in 2014, this actually presented a bunch of interesting challenges to us because by having a merchant facility per customer, we were wearing a cost of trying to grow really fast, but it took a really long time to onboard our customers. It would take four to six weeks to actually get through underwriting, and in some cases, some of, some of our sort of prospects would lose interest by the time they completed that process if they'd even get through it, and we needed to fix it. So one of the things we did at the time was actually become a, a registered ISO, so an independent sales org, so that we could market, oops, sorry, that's not very good. Uh, we could market, um, uh, merchant facilities direct to our customers, and that amount allowed us to kind of get that onboarding down time and underwriting time down to sort of one to two days. Um, and then we're in the generosity sector, and generosity is also just a little bit different. Um, so we're primarily processing gifts. We're not exchanging money for physical goods or tickets for the most part or any kind of other thing that might be like traded. Um, we're dealing with tithes and donations. If you're not really familiar with tithes, this is where you give a percentage of your income to the church, traditionally 10%, but it kind of varies depending on faith and kind of the, the, how wealthy the, the church in the area which it operates. Um, and payments are a combination for us of one time and recurring. So we have people that are processing one time payments, they're sort of giving in the moment. So if they're in church or when they're just feeling generous or they hear about a cause they're interested in, they can just go and give straight away. And we also have people that are doing this more sort of ties and sort of like giving to the church on a regular basis where they'll set up a recurring payment often aligned with when they're getting their Salary, so that maybe the 1st and 15th, they'll set up a payment for a fixed amount that'll come out all the time. Um, and because we're dealing with churches, our uptick is a bit different. Sorry, windows. <laughs> uh, our uptick is a little bit different to everyone else's. So on a US Sunday uh, is when we see a strong uptick in volume uh, as people are sitting in church and getting out their phones to give. The other thing about churches is that they're a community. And it, like for a community, trust is the currency of a community. So the trust between the community members, which is the church goers and the church, is really important. Uh, we see that um, the trust between those community members and the church um, is also really easy to erode, and we have to be very careful. Uh, so when someone picks a, or when a church picks a technology provider, um, such as Pushpay, you might think, say, like, if Pushpay is having a bad day, a gateway's down, we're unable to process payments, that that's going to put people off using push pay, and the church goers will be like, that push pay, that we need to get rid of that, that's no good. That's not what really happens. They actually start losing trust in their church's ability to select an appropriate technology, and they may just stop giving to their church completely. They're sort of put off by the experience. 
Um, and that's not, not a great outcome. And it can be sort of irreparable in some ways. Like if you have a really poor choice of technology provider, you will see those people either sort of stop giving to the church or the amount they give goes down and doesn't come back up again. So we need to be sort of very careful with that trust. So it's 2014. Um, <laughs> it's a US Sunday. Uh, we're like a new, fresh team. We're all excited. The gateway goes down, yeah, or our gateway we're using goes down. You can imagine we're sort of leaping on call. We're calling everybody. We're getting our gateway on the line. We're like, get, get this stuff back up. This is terrible. We're all going to die. It's down. Well, that sounds great. But in reality, we just didn't even know we were down. So... <laughs> In 2014, we were really immature. The, the, unfortunately, the normally when we'd find out we were down, in the first case, was when a customer would call us, or even worse, worse, when an investor would call us to let us know we were down. That is not a place you want to be. That is something you need to fix. We could do a lot better. Um, and in our case, that tied in really nicely with being a young engineering team and wanting to introduce a bit of traditional rigor. And we did that through postmortems. Well, in fact, blameless postmortems, which we sort of adopted from Etsy's process. Um, so a process of a postmortem is really sort of in the, in, in, after an incident or during an incident, you sort of collect a bit of a timeline. You're trying to see what went well and what did not go well about your incident response, and then sort of try and take some learnings from that and possibly even identify some mitigation so you can stop it happening again or mitigate some of the, the impact so that it has less impact the next time it happens. And for us, we did something which was both intentional and not necessarily intentional, which was we decided we're a payments company. We need to do postmortems when we are failing to serve our customers. So if we fail to process a payment for our customers for something that maybe we did from an engineering perspective, that was a reason to initiate a post-mortem. This also applied to gateway outages. So even though it was something that was outside of our control in many ways, at least that's how we felt at the time, sorry, uh, we, uh, we, we still sort of would instigate a post-mortem for that. And it had some really good outcomes for us. That meant we, uh, our incident response um, process, we kind of looked at how things were going, we would kind of go, oh, maybe we need to deal with our gateways a bit better, and we also would identify opportunities to actually sort of mitigate some of those, those potential losses. Um, so early on in our journey, we weren't processing a lot of payments, I sort of indicated we were doing sort of about a million dollars a year. That meant that there could be hours without payments overnight, it was kind of tricky. Um, to deal with that, we sort of initially started looking at connectivity as our first sort of low-hanging fruit for really kind of getting to be more aware of what was going on with our gateways. And the way we approached this was really simple. We just had sort of like a pingdom, so just some kind of ping tool, pointing out our gateways externally so that we could kind of see if they were up or not. And at the same time, we introduced a health check endpoint internally with our, on our network um, that would, when hit, run just a, a simple set of tests to kind of see from within our network, can we reach back out to that gateway so that we could kind of test things like firewall configuration, proxy configuration, that kind of thing. The combination of those two things allowed us to kind of really narrow in quickly when we had a connectivity issue as to where it was happening. Was it something we'd done internally um, that might mean that we need to roll back some kind of infrastructural change? Or was it something external, like the gateway is down and then we need to start escalating? Um, we don't really rely on connectivity tracking or testing anymore. We have more than enough volume 24-7 that, that the actual payments themselves become the indicator of failure now. But there were some really nice side effects of establishing this process really early on. Um, so for instance, like sort of middle of last year, I think it was July, uh, we had an, an issue with first data where they actually messed up some DNS records for us because we had really good connectivity um, sort of tracking and monitoring. At that point that happened, we were able to jump in, identify that there was a connectivity issue, that it was a DNS issue, look back over our records of what the actual IP address used to resolve to for that um, service endpoint, and then reach out to Spreadly and go, hey, would you mind just sort of temporarily creating a host entry just to work around this issue because first data has kind of not got it all together right now. Um, and thankfully, that, that, say, that, that kind of relationship allowed us to save quite a lot of volume um, over that incident. So beyond sort of just connectivity tracking, the things that we need, need to do is sort of start dealing with the more nuanced um, side of classifying responses. There's a lot of opportunity to identify failures that aren't classic just connectivity issues, but are more sort of something going wrong with the gateway or the gateway's behavior. And we classify our responses into sort of three buckets. So we have those user recoverable errors. Those are responses or response codes that we we know we can build some user experience around, we can have people um, sort of go through a flow of say, oh, I've got a bank declined or insufficient funds, we can provide an appropriate message, they can try the payment again. And then the, the, the bucket we're really most interested in around incident response, we have three um, response codes. We have gateway incorrectly configured. So if you recall, I mentioned we have lots and lots of merchant facilities. It's possible that one of those merchant facilities may say have an expired password or an incorrect login. And in those instances, we, we, um, we can identify that in the response and classify it appropriately. 
That's really only going to affect one customer at a time, so it's not necessarily the kind of thing we want to wake up our whole on-call team for, depending on the size of the customer. And then we have two other responses, which is communication error and provider error. So communication error is kind of is what it sounds like. That would be an issue with us being able to either talk to Spreadly, talk through Spreadly to the gateway, or even potentially some kind of upstream issue with, say, a bank or a card brand that then looks like a communication error um, presented by the gateway. We also have uh, provider failure. So provider failure is really sort of the counterexample to user recoverable. They're a non-user recoverable error where we need to escalate with the gateway to either go like, hey, what's going on? There's something weird happening with the behavior of a gateway. We're seeing persistent failures that are not use our user's fault. Um, and we sort of have discovered those over time as we go. And then last of all, we have unknown errors. So those are where we actually can't classify the response because we've never seen anything like that before. And when we get those, we've just got a, a task of investigating them and figuring out how to classify them. So when we think about classification of responses, um, gateways return structured responses. You're getting JSON, you're getting XML. We're talking to quite a lot of different gateways. Unfortunately, like no gateway is, kind of, well, none of these gateways have really agreed upon a good way to represent these things in a common way. So you'll get an error code, you'll get some error messaging, um, but every gateway decides to kind of group the error codes independently or different ways. And unfortunately, it's a really leaky abstraction. We see in some cases, gateways will group things that we would consider a provider error. It's not user recoverable alongside something that is recoverable, um, so say like CVV incorrectly entered. Um, and it can be quite challenging to kind of tease those apart if you're relying on the codes. And we tried to look, look at this in different ways over time, and we just kind of eventually came to the conclusion, no, you can't do it. Just treat it as text, pass it as text. Um, this sounds like it shouldn't work, but it just works really well. Um, and the other thing is it actually gives you a real, uh, it gives you some nice benefits in that you can use the same approach for classifying weird responses you get back from gateways. When a gateway starts giving you HTML back, for instance, um, I won't name any names. <laughs> um, for us, uh, we deal with sort of, um, we, we sort of like doing declarative rules for these kinds of things. It's the kind of code that we're gonna present back to the business so they can also kind of check out our working, check our thinking. So we have sort of declarative rules for doing this. In this case, it's pretty simple. We've got uh, something where we're looking for the upstream error occurred text. We're gonna map that to being a decline for comms error. And this is a rule that's only gonna be applied to the pin gateway through Spreadly. Um, when we first started doing this, we kind of fell into this pattern of adding these declarative rules, and we didn't really think too much about how we were evaluating them. We stored them in a list, and we'd start adding them to the bottom of the list. It worked okay for a while until we started realizing nobody wanted to touch this code because no one felt safe adding new rules. They had to decide very carefully, do I add it at the bottom? Do I put it somewhere in the middle, at the top? Because it was a risk of occluding an existing rule and causing it its own post-mortem just by adding a new rule. Um, as we kind of sat and thought about it, it actually kind of occurred to us it's really quite simple. Um, what we need to do is just sort those rules in a way that goes from most specific to least specific. And so we just sort them by the length of text we're searching for and then how specific the rule is. If the rule's getting applied across, say, all gateways, because it might be, say, we're looking just for the evidence of they're giving us back an HTML response, we'd make that less specific than a rule where we're making it specific for a single gateway or a single card brand. And then if we don't match any rules, then it's classified as an unknown error and we'll sort of trigger off a process of investigating what, uh, how to map that later. So once we had these provider errors and communication errors, um, it was a good opportunity to then start actually putting in place some alerting of like when they had elevated rates, um, which is great. You're kind of getting this alerting now. We've got a lot more uh, like idea of what's down. We might know what's down before our customers do. But we're sort of then stuck with the problem. It's like, what do we do? We're going to sort of log in. We're going to sort of triage maybe what issue it is, is it a gateway down, we'll start escalating the gateway. But meanwhile, there's just, things are on fire, we're just seeing payments failing, this is not kind of a great outcome. And one of the first things we came to was like, it's really simple to kind of just turn off our scheduled payments engine and stop processing scheduled payments, at least during a gateway outage. And so we started with a manual command for doing this. Um, but as we kind of went, uh, we realized sort of, um, with the manual command, there were some operational concerns we needed to address. Um, and we really decided like, chat ops, um, and so we wanted to know sort of who executed the command, and then we really want to know like, how do I know it's off? Like if I'm on call, how is the system gonna wake me up to let me know? And the way we did this was pretty simple. So we have a manual command for turning off the scheduled payments engine. When we turn it off, we end up with a Slack message where we do our incident response. It's gonna indicate what the state was before and is now, so in this case, yep, the engine is off, and who did it? So in this case, I turned the scheduled payment engine off. And then the other thing we do is we have a health check endpoint again, um, which will check if the scheduled payment engine is on or off. So in this case, if the scheduled payment engine is off, we count that as a loss, and this health check endpoint starts returning like a status code 400. We're able to ping a point pinged them at it, 
and then wire that up to PagerDuty for our alerts. So we'll then get a PagerDuty alert to say the health check is down. Uh, this has sort of covers off both those um, concerns we had. This is going to wake people up when we know the scheduled payment engine has been turned off. And then even better, it's going to keep bugging us every 15 minutes until we turn the scheduled payment engine back on. Because if we forget to turn it back on, that can have sort of real world consequences for our customers and especially their payers. If we allow scheduled payments to sort of run into the next day, um, potentially people could be expecting that the money's already come out and then they go and spend money that then we later take out and they miss a rent payment or something like that. And that's just not cool. So we had this manual command and we were pretty happy. You know, we could turn the scheduled payment engine on and off. But there was a little bit of a problem with this in that it's two in the morning, you get paged, you kind of get up, you get your laptop in, you then have to go to a payments list, sort through all the payments, try and figure out which payments failed, try and figure out which gateway it is or what the problem is. And it's only at that point that you probably go, oh, I should turn the scheduled payment engine off, at which point we might have lost 10 to 15 minutes worth of scheduled payments that we've kind of been plowing through, just sort of throwing them into the ground. We're losing a bunch of payments. We're really not happy about this. Um, so we needed to start automatically triggering. But on what? And in our case, it was pretty simple. We had these provider areas and communication areas that definitely needed an instant response, so it made a real good case for turning our um, scheduled payment engine off. We also considered unknown, given that those could potentially be a... Um, a provider error or a communications error we're yet to classify, but inevitably, week on week, we get new unknown errors, and 99% of them are not provider errors or communication errors. We're actually dealing with sort of things like unusual AVS errors we've not seen before, um, things like that. And so they're sort of really more user recovery errors we haven't done. So if you love your on-call team, don't wake them up for unknown errors, but we still need a process in place to at least identify overall elevated error rates and kind of wake people up for that. Um, and so much like we do for uh, classifying um, the rules for uh, response, we do the same thing for triggers. So here's what our, our rule for triggering looks like. So we're looking for three comms or provider errors within a sort of five minute period. In that case, we're gonna raise what we call a payment failure reaction type. So we tried to separate what we do for identifying when to trigger from then what different parts of our system will take actions. So the, turning the scheduled payments engine off would just be one thing that's kind of looking at that payment failure reaction type of comms or provider error and then doing something appropriate. Um, once we introduced this, we needed to kind of revisit what our uh, on-call story looked like again, because now we're waking somebody up and they don't know who turned the engine off or why. Um, and so we did a couple of things here. We needed to put in why it was turned off. So in this case, we turned it off automatically, say, because of a communication failure. And then more importantly, we keep track of all of the payments that have contributed to that trigger and include links to them in our messages. And this means when people get woken up, they very quickly jump in there, click on that link, have a look at, say, the transcript and Spreadly, and within a two or three seconds, they kind of a, have got a, a keyed in as to what the actual problem is and can start deciding to escalate with a gateway or not. So that kind of did it for schedule payments, but for the first couple of years, we were really sort of resigned to the fact that when we're processing these sort of one-off payments, these people just getting their phone out and giving in church in the moment, that they were just kind of going to fall on the ground, and we're just waiting there, watching the clock, beating sort of our head, head against the wall, kind of waiting for our gateway to kind of sort the issue out so that we can then get back to processing payments. It wasn't a great feeling. We felt like we were sort of out of control. Um, and I sort of mentioned, mentioned initially that we were processing both through Spreadly and non-Spreadly non sort of direct with gateways. But over time, we'd moved all that communication over to using Spreadly. And as through postmortems, we kind of looking at mitigations or possible mitigations, like actually, if we're already tokenizing all of our payment methods through Spreadly, and you know, we're getting to the point where we're about to process that payment, we could just not process it and come back to it later. We're not exchanging anything for goods. There's nothing we really need to kind of hold there. We don't need to process these payments immediately. And that's where sort of delayed payments, as we call it, came into, um, came into sort of our minds. Um, and what that process looks like is this. So first of all, we'll pick a gateway, or really a gateway type. We have a lot of gateway configurations, but they're for a gateway type, so, so like first data, NMI, different kinds of gateways. We'll pick one of those gateways and say, let's set that to delayed. The next thing that happens is just at the point that we're about to do some communications to sort of enact a payment um, with the gateway, we'll check, is that gateway delayed? If it is, we just choose not to do the gateway communications and kind of put that payment aside into a queue for later. The next thing we do is, once the gateway uh, issues are over and we're kind of happy, like, oh, yep, they've sorted that issue out, we'll turn the gateway delay off. That means any new payments coming in against those, that gateway type will start getting processed, so just we can kind of observe how things are going. And then last of all, we'll come back and release those delayed payments for processing once we're really happy everything's stable. To do this, we needed to change a few things about our payment experience. So this is our success messages for payments. Um, and you can see, like, the top message is what we normally tell users when things are going well. Uh, if we've got delayed payments turned on, 
then we're going to actually change the messaging up a little bit. So we use the language authorized instead of success. And we'll use sort of, you know, we'll tell you when it's been processed via email rather than we're going to send you a receipt. Um, and we were a little bit worried when we first introduced it that maybe like this language would be confusing, but it's turned out to be incredibly not confusing. We've had virtually no support tickets related to this kind of change in experience when we're delaying a gateway, which has been really pleasing. Um, the other thing is we had to sort of think about the on-call story. We now have a new queue. So instead of turning the scheduled payments engine off, we've got these delayed payments sitting there that we need to process within a certain amount of time. Otherwise, we start running into issues. And we have a bot that takes care of this for us. So it's just observing the delayed payments queue, and it's going to then um, run out a message on a periodic basis, kind of like how many payments have we got in the queue for each of gateway, because we could be, unfortunately, having multiple gateways having issues at the same time sort of overlapping, where we may be trying to process the queue for one while sort of accumulating payments on the other because the issue hasn't been resolved. Um, and this is kind of working really well for us. Now, processing delayed payments is interesting. Um, one of the things, because we sort of, we put this feature in manually and started using it before we automated it, is we were not quite ready for the, the somewhat obvious realization that once you're queuing all these payments up, you don't really know when it's safe to turn it back on. I mean, most of us are used to kind of a gateway outage, but you're relying on seeing actual payments succeed to trust that the gateway has fixed the issue. You're not going to rely on the gateway going, yeah, it's all good, just because it never is. It's always kind of like, yeah, in about half an hour, it'll kind of even out. Um, so we need to come up with a process for this. This is kind of pretty manual for us, but it's not, it's not really an issue. We'll go and find one of the churches that's impacted by this outage. We'll make a $1 gift to them, and then we're able to just go in and find that payment within the queue and just release that one payment. We'll monitor to see if that succeeds. If that's looking good, then the next thing we'll do is just undelay that gateway so that new payments coming in, we can kind of monitor those, see how they're going. Once we've seen a period of stability, we used to be very cautious about that. It was like an hour. We've got a lot more confidence in the way things work now. So it's normally about five to 10 minutes of stability. Then we'll start releasing the payments that we've got queued up. But again, we're really, really risk averse. So we'll always go and sort of sort those payments by dollar value first and pick a small batch of low dollar value payments. So really protecting our customers from any additional risk if that gateway is actually kind of still flapping release those first, and then if we're happy there, we'll just release the rest. Um, the other thing is we're fairly conservative, so we're not trying to rush these out the door. We kind of trickle them out one at a time, um, so we sort of, we just want to eventually catch up. We're not, um, not going to try and put ourselves at risk by processing them really quickly and have another failure. So that brings us to the, the sort of elephant of the room. Like, what if Spreedly's down? Well, for starters, if it was, I imagine we'd see some people exiting the door <laughs> then very quietly. Uh, yeah, 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 it's fine. You don't know. It's all good. Um, but no, it's in all serious, like, we, we, we're, again, very risk-averse. We kind of thought this room was like, you know, if Spreedly's down, unfortunately, that means we're not going to be processing, processing with any of our gateways. It's the one sort of risk of picking one of those providers to kind of fend all your payments through. Um, at the same time, we won't be able to tokenize new payment methods. So it kind of initially sort of sounds like a game over. If Spreedly's down, we've put all our eggs in the Spreedly basket. We're not going to be able to proceed. But that's not really true, because the, the audience we've got are people who are churchgoers. They're coming to church every week. Most of them are going to end up with an account. They've got a payment method they've captured from the first time they did a payment. And those people can just proceed through our experience without actually needing to do tokenization. So we're still able to sort of save those payments. And then the other thing we do is that we don't actually sort of mark Spreedly as a, an overall gateway of being down and then just not try to tokenize. We'll keep trying to tokenize with Spreedly on the hopes that it may succeed. If it fails, we say, like, I get a communications error with Spreedly, what we're going to do at that point is actually just change our user experience. We go, hey, you could use one of your existing payment methods, or why don't you try this kind of groovy thing called ACH for this payment, and you can kind of then fend them off towards a different payment method type entirely so that we can still complete that transaction. Um, and this is working really well. To be honest, Spreely doesn't really go down, so it hasn't been a problem. Woo! <laughs> um, so I've been calling this delayed payments all the way through. That's definitely not what we call it. Do not quote me on this. Um, we actually call it Assure Payments. So this originally came out as a, a feature that we identified as sort of a, on the back of a mitigation. So we feel a lot of pain as an on-call team. We sort of pride ourselves on how quickly we respond to these payment issues. And it hurts, us, it hurts us deep in our heart when payments don't succeed for our customers. It's not good. And more importantly, the impact analysis is horrific. So you want to just not do impact analysis on these incidents at 2 in the morning. You just want to go back to sleep. Um, but as we, we sort of work through this feature, and we call it delayed payments because that's, you know, we're developers. It's like, well, we're delaying the payments, so it's delayed payments. That's just what you call it. Um, when we were getting near to releasing it, um, sort of our VP of Eng and some other people were kind of going, actually, you know what? Like, there's an appetite for this. Our customers really, really want this. 
really plays into this theme of trust. You know, they don't want us kind of failing their, their givers and then kind of that becoming an erosion of trust with the church. Why don't we start marketing to customers? And at the same time, why don't we think about renaming this a little bit because we don't really want this negative term. And so we, we pivoted. Ah, no, sorry. We pivoted and decided to call it the sure payments, which was really sort of identifying it based on the duty it fulfilled the customer. And it taught us sort of a really valuable lesson, I think, which is like, we hadn't really think, thought about marketing these internal engineering features around payment resilience to customers. And it turns out it's what we do is what we're good at. Why shouldn't we be sort of marketing it? Um, and to date, in the last quarter, we've saved about $4 million worth of payments. Um, and somewhat sort of ironically or awesomely, like in the last talk, we actually had assured payments go off for the first data. And we sort of saved a few thousand dollars of payments as well just then. So it's, how many? 25K. There we go. Woo. So the system works. Uh, so just in wrapping up, like uh, I guess I've got a few takeaways. Um, I think when you're starting out especially, it seems like payment processing issues are really sort of out of your control. They're just not. And it ties in really closely with, I think, establishing a process to learn from your payment outages. Once you have that process and once you broaden the reach, so when you're conducting a post-mortem, it's an opportunity to share with the wider engineering team. People who were not involved at all in the incident response are going to come by and kind of go, hey, you know, I've got some ideas about how we could actually make this better how we could save some of those payments. And then I think on top of that, when you start thinking about these mitigations, definitely employ them manually and learn about how to safely operate them manually before you then automate them. Um, and this has two sort of good, really, really good outcomes. I think you end up with a much safer command to operate manually, um, and you get a, like a better outcome from a chat ops perspective. But also it means you can manually employ them because what we find is like triggering covers the basis or the, the scenarios you know but inevitably, gateways are going to throw up situations you aren't anticipating where your triggering is not going to be capturing that. And being able to just manually turn those mitigations on or off for a period of time is actually really cool. And it kind of helps build your roadmap for what you're going to actually build for your triggering functionality in the future. Cool. So that was all I had to say. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, find me during the break. Thank you.